Good afternoon, everyone. You can't hear me? Okay. <laughs> Yes, so I'm Mark Mitchell. I um, uh, work here with the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. I am the uh, founder and um, the director of the Climate and Health Equity Fellowship Program. <clears throat> the uh, program, as you heard, is in its third year. Uh, we have our, our third class. Uh, but we wanted to tell you a little bit about the, the program and what we um, have been doing. Um, as Lisa has said, um, the purpose of the uh, fellowship is to uh, help to diversify the um, uh, number of people in the, and particularly physicians uh, involved in uh, climate and health equity and, and also to advance uh, both equitable and um, health-related climate solutions. You know, there are a number of solutions that, uh, for, uh, for climate change, but some of them uh, can uh, help to advance equity. Others um, can um, uh, keep in place the disparities, the, the, the current health disparities. Uh, some of them can uh, engage health and, and, and improve health. Um, others of the solutions don't. So what we do is we have a 10 month program uh, where we have um, eight, uh, eight hours per month, uh, four hours, uh, two half days a month, uh, four hours of didactic education, where we try to introduce our fellows uh, to some of the national leaders of color uh, in the climate and health space so that they can be resources for each other. Um, in the environmental justice community, we see, I'm sorry, in the climate, uh, climate and health community, we see uh, climate change uh, and uh, climate justice as being an outgrowth of the environmental justice uh, uh, um, movement. Uh, in environmental justice, you know, we see uh, a lot of health effects from uh, the disproportionate environmental exposures. Uh, and we know that climate change makes these health effects um, worse. Uh, so what we, so in the uh, physicians of color uh, oftentimes come from communities uh, that are most impacted uh, and um, or have other relationships uh, uh, with uh, people in the communities. Um, we did a survey of the National Medical Association physicians and found that half of them uh, had a patient uh, that were low income. Half of them also had uh, patient populations that were 50% more uh, people or people of color. Um, so we, so our physicians see the health effects first um, in their patients and are very, very motivated uh, to do something uh, to act, uh, but haven't had sort of the, the opportunity. So what the uh, chef fellowship, has done is to uh, try to, again, uh, train um, these physicians. The first year we had six physicians in the Southeastern states. Um, the second year uh, we had 12 physicians from all over the country. Um, and in uh, this year uh, we have 13. Uh, we have a, a staff, uh, a small staff. I wanted to um, introduce uh, them. Um, uh, Dr. Venice Curry, could you raise your, your hand? Um, uh, from California, she's a psychiatrist, community psychiatrist. Uh, Dr. Kimberly Williams, um, back, back there, uh, who um, we also have um, uh, next to her, uh, Clarissa. Um, uh, and then we have um, Jordan Curry uh, Carter. And then uh, joining us now, uh, is uh, Dr. Shanita Johnson. Um, I will be uh, resigning from the uh, Medical Society. I'll be retiring from the Medical Society Consortium in, in uh, September, and uh, Dr. Johnson will be taking over uh, at that time. So um, want to, we, we have a number of partners, um, a number of our um, we have a lot of restrictions on, on our physicians and where they come from. We, we're focusing on the southeastern states, uh, the Gulf states uh, specifically, 
and then also uh, physicians from uh, some of the medical societies, uh, the National Medical Association, the National Hispanic Medical Association, the National Council of Asian uh, and Pacific Islander Physicians, uh, the, the, American As the As Association of American Indian Physicians, uh, the GLMA, um, uh, health providers for LGBT um, plus, uh, and then also the American College of Physicians um, all have um, students that, that um, are part of our fellows uh, uh, program. So we want to tell you a little bit about their uh, capstone projects from last year uh, and uh, and, uh, and so first, I wanted to introduce uh, Dr. Shanita Johnson. Uh, she's a surgeon, a bariatric surgeon uh, from Morehouse um, uh, College. And Shanita, please come. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to be here at the annual meeting with you all. And I really want to start by applauding the medical consortium, Dr. Sarfati, Dr. Patel, Dr. Mitchell, for the vision that they had in putting forth this, uh, this fellowship, which has allowed us to be, to be educated so that we can now become advocates for our patients and for our communities in a space that really I had, I'll speak personally, I had no expertise. And in the space of a few short months, with their dedication, they have allowed us to be able to be advocates and voices in spaces we had never thought we could be, but we needed to be, because we need to talk about the health equity impacts, the disparities that we see, and really talk to our patients, communities, uh, legislators, and, and the list goes on. So I want to start by first saying thank you, because you have now through this impacted so many. So I'm one of the old heads per se. I'm, I'm from the first inaugural uh, cohort, one of six and one of my colleagues, Dr. Bethany Carlos is here in the audience. She's here in DC. My capstone was looking at African-American physicians views on climate change. And so we looked at a survey from the Southeast this was sent out to National Medical Association physicians. And there were a few key findings that I'd like to pull out for you to see. 97% of physicians, almost every single one, reported that climate change was important to them. They also felt that it would impact them and they were worried, worried about the climate change impacts on themselves, on their patients, on their communities, on future generations. And, and others. But at, look at the bottom. We were not educated. 36% cited a lack of knowledge regarding climate change. And there was also a lack of uh, feeling empowered to speak about climate change and its impact on health. And so this survey is being uh, published, but it is the reason why this fellowship exists so that we can now educate the physicians who are in these communities to carry that message forward. This was a busy fellowship. So in addition to the capstone, we had lots of opportunities to be involved and to start very early being a voice for these populations. We had a resolution passed through the National Medical Association with the help of Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Brown and others on climate change, health and equity, which was adopted in July of that year that I was in fellowship. I am also a part of the NAM Action Collaborative. We spoke at uh, Johnson & Johnson with, with Johnson & Johnson at Climate Week uh, for the 2021 Lancet Countdown and others. I'm a co-editor of a book on climate change and health equity justice that is being published with Johns Hopkins Publishing as we speak and should be a textbook to, to go out into medical schools and many, many other uh, opportunities. And these have continued since. I am a surgeon and I am, I will say that we don't have many conversations in surgery about climate change and its impact, uh, <laughs> but we are starting. And so now with this education, I'm able to sit at the tables and explain to surgeons why this matters, why this impacts the patient that is lying on the operating room table, 
why you know the energy that we are using the anesthetics and so many of the waste that we produce our single use um, equipment why all of that matters uh, for our planet we don't want to stop here at our one year fellowship and so um, this is Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Williams' brainchild that I will move forward, which is the Chef Alumni Engagement Network. And what we will do with this network is engage the alumni of the three cohorts and all additional cohorts going forward. So we will help to diversify the climate and health movement and increase the representation of voices, diverse voices in this space of climate change and health equity. We hope that we will continue to engage in policy and decision-making processes and center health equity within these climate solutions. And hopefully we'll also inspire others to join us and to use their voices as well in this space. So we will use the annual cohorts as our start and add cohorts as well, as well as the consortium. And some of the things that we plan to do are advocacy, networking and education. And I've listed what we plan to do in these three areas and certainly make a very broad and diverse network of physicians speaking in climate change and health equity. We're kicking it off now. Welcome to the kickoff. <laughs> and so um, we are starting with this uh, three cohorts and we will begin sending emails, Google networks, and have a repository of activity as we become more active in this space. So again, thank you for your vision and for arming us so that we can be good advocates for our communities. So thank you, Dr. Johnson. Yeah, we provide a lot of training in advocacy. Uh, half of our time is spent on you know how to advocate, uh, how to write um, op-eds, how to um, uh, present at, at um, conferences, how to speak to reporters, and so we meet people like um, Time Magazine reporters and and you know and, and meteorologists from the Weather Channel and and so on like that uh, to come and talk to us about these issues. So um, as Dr. Johnson said, we are uh, kicking off our alumni association. We're going to be, um, we, the purpose of it is to uh, provide speakers uh, to um, organizations um, nationally. Uh, and also, you know, if you need uh, it, it, um, people to write op-eds or to author op-eds or to do other kinds of, of things, you know, we're, we're interested in, uh, in doing that. We also try to get, uh, for example, the National Medical Association state affiliates to um, work with our uh, the consortium state affiliates. Um, uh, Dr. Um, Bethany Carlos had a joint meeting, you know, joint meetings between, and, and other uh, organizations have it, joint meetings between the state National Medical Associations and the state um, network affiliates of the consortium. Uh, so next, I'd like to uh, bring uh, Dr. Renee Settle-Robinson. Uh, she's a podiatrist uh, from Milwaukee uh, to talk about her capstone program. Good afternoon, everybody. I am delighted to be here and to speak to you about my experience with the Climate and Health Equity Fellowship conducted by the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. Um, I am a podiatric surgeon, and I practice at a federally qualified healthcare center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So how in the world does climate affect feet? Well, feet are farther from your heart than any other part of your body, and they're much more vulnerable to all of the various aspects of climate change. People don't oftentimes think about uh, floods as being particularly having an impact on feet, but they are because you've got to get to safety. And how do you get to safety? You have to walk through those floodwaters. And so as you study the kinds of things that happen to those floodwaters, aside from how rapid things flow through those floodwaters, the potential for injury contamination is very, very high. Your feet are very vulnerable 
the temperature changes. I mean, everybody knows that if it gets too cold, you can get frostbite. If it gets too hot, you can get burns. Um, but specifically treating marginalized communities, you pay attention to whether or not people can afford the kind of shoes that are appropriate for the weather or the circumstances. So I think whenever you see patients, regardless of what you're seeing them for, what they wear on their feet should be documented in your medical record, as I think it should be a social determinant of health. If a person is poor and has no other transportation options except their feet, their feet need to be properly covered. Um, if they have less finances for proper shoe gear, um, like for example, in the wintertime, if somebody comes in in sandals or, or flip-flops or bedroom slippers, there's one of two reasons. Either they cannot afford the proper shoe gear, which puts their feet at additional danger, or their feet are in such severe pain that there's nothing that they can tolerate wearing on their feet. So all of those play into that as well. Um, environmental injustice is what plays the biggest role in creating those health disparities. Um, and they cause despair among the people who live under those circumstances. What did I miss? Oh yes. And structural racism is in constant battle with the innate ability of our community to survive and to thrive. So my capstone project, um, I talk about climate change that impacts podiatry. And I gave a lecture last summer at the National Medical Association convention at the podiatric medicine and surgery section. And thankfully, I was able to inspire a couple of my colleagues who are now a part of the 2023 cohort. Um, and I also submitted a resolution before the House of Delegates of the National Medical Association advocating for climate education for all of our physicians, and it was adopted. Um, thank you. Um, the AUCD stands for Association of University Clinics on Disabilities. And so along with my colleague, Dr. Frank Samanti, we presented what was reviewed as the best lecture during that conference on the impact of climate on people with disabilities. When we had Hurricane Katrina, over 1800 people died in that event. And it was disproportionately poor people, people with disabilities, elderly children, people who did not have the personal wherewithal to run when they said, get out of here because this is gonna be a disaster. And so we want to advocate for all of our cities to set up plans in the future so that in the event there's gonna be a catastrophic event, all of those people are considered and plans are in place to get them to safety as well. So the remainder of my capstone project is to write an article on climate change and its impact in podiatry. The Journal of the National Medical Association is planning on dedicating an issue to climate change and it'll be published in that issue. And I thank you very much for your attention. Is there anything else you would like to know? I think we're gonna hold those questions until the end, okay? Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saddle Robinson. So as you can see, we try to um, have our physicians to focus um, on their specialty and on projects uh, within their specialty. But we also um, have people to focus on vulnerability, um, not just income, not just race, but other uh, vulnerabilities. Um, Next, we have Dr. Yvonne Collins. Uh, she's a uh, GYN uh, oncologist uh, out of uh, Chicago, and her she uh, will focus on social determinants of health.
Good evening. I'd like to thank Dr. Mitchell and the consortium and NMA for the opportunity. Um, it was definitely a, a very wild ride of 10 months, but with lots of education um, that I think is really, really important. Um, I come from a community where it's everything that we've talked about today. It's uh, power plants, it's poor water, it's poor soil, it's no trees. Um, and so I've always seen the effects that it has. And now I can speak intelligently about not only that, but how you look at solutions. Um, so as Dr. Mitchell said, I'm a gynecologic oncologist, but additionally, I'm the chief medical officer for County Care, which is a Medicaid plan in Chicago. Um, and everybody knows Medicaid and those who fall within Medicaid are those that are significantly in terms of income at lower levels. And so my capstone project is really looking at the intersection of climate, health and equity, but also the importance of the workforce. As we set the stage, we know that social determinants of health are defined as those environments where you live, where you play, where you worship, where you go to school, where you uh, also live, and then age as we go over time. We also know that those are the same non-medical factors that have significant effects on your health outcomes. When we look at it, I cannot control my diabetes if I have to worry about where I live, what I eat, or how I'm going to store my insulin at the end of the night. When we look at it, poverty, income, and unemployment are the key factors that lead to access. I can't talk about improved health care if I don't have any health care at all. And health care disparities are drastically uh, multiplied in the midst of climate change. And so when we look at climate change, one of those opportunities is really to look at how we begin to move people out of poverty. And one of those opportunities is with green jobs. And we know that our populations very commonly don't have access to those. So my capstone project was really to look at if we can look at workforce development, can that be the change agent to changing not only poverty, but the ramifications of climate change also. Everybody's seen this graphic. If you look at the center of it, we talk about it all the time. Rising temperatures, changes in water levels, more extreme weather, increasing CO2. But that outer circle is what we continue to focus on when we look at healthcare disparities and solutions. The asthma, the hypertension, the renal disease, the cancers, those are where we as healthcare providers can make an impact if we change the trajectory of what we're seeing with climate change today. This is just one graphic you heard some earlier, maternal morbidity. African-American women are three to four more times more likely to die in um, childbirth than other populations. When we look at high blood pressure, diabetes, stroke, those differences aren't as, as significant, but still there are drastic differences in not only the development of those diseases, but the ramifications that come after that. When you look at the social determinants in that arrow, at the bottom of that, it all leads back to access to care and I can't access care without the money I have. When you look at the wealth gap, although this slide is slightly older, you can see on the far right, the 30 year difference in the wealth gap. That gap continues to increase and today it's even more drastic. If you look on the left, that gives you the differences in, in race and ethnicity along those same lines. That solid green line being whites, that checkered line right under it is blacks, you go down some, you, it's Hispanics and then other races, but that has now flipped. We now know based on the statistical data from 2023 that the Asian populations make $115,000 and Blacks are $45,000 annually. So when we look at that income, we know that there are always changes and continue to be changes in that wealth gap. And my goal is to change that. When we look at green jobs, this is just a list, but these are all the jobs when we talk about it that look at recycling, re waste, uh, waste management, sustainability, energy, and that's where we can make a difference. According to the green jobs promo, we know that there are 875,000 people that have those green jobs, but there's gonna be an 8.6% increase over the next few years, increasing that jobs to another 115,000. When we look at the income, um, no need to look at all of the graphic, but I just wanted to give you the range of incomes for green jobs. And these are green jobs that don't require a college education because we know at least in inner city Chicago, all of our students are not gonna go to college. So they need other options in terms of things for them to do. You can see the salary ranges anywhere from $114,000 in managerial jobs down to 30,000. The populations that we focus on, some of our lower income um, areas, 
don't even hit that $30,000 mark in terms of their median income. So this gives them a real opportunity for change to move them from poverty to a sustainable wage, to a living wage, to hopefully out of poverty and more access. As I started to look at this for my capstone project, I really couldn't find really good information on what the wages were on these jobs, what was the number of, of folks that were in these jobs, the ethnic breakdown of the, of, of, of the jobs, and the geographic distribution. And so I, I'm, I'm glad that I found this because the Bureau of Labor Statistics doesn't know either. So that's one of their initiatives. They want to find that out. So hopefully by the time I'm done, they'll have some of this solved for me. But my capstone project really looked at, can we develop a model that we can take from local Chicago nationally to really look at moving people out of that poverty range? So identification of the opportunity. I looked at our neighborhoods in Chicago and chose two, Austin and North Lawndale. Again, when we look at income, those are primarily black and Hispanic communities. Inglewood has a median income of $22,000. Uh, North Lawndale has a median income of $35,000. The vast majority of the folks in those neighborhoods don't have any degrees after maybe a GED equivalent. And so when we look at the impact those communities can have, I find it substantial. Documentation, documentation of the resources. What do they currently have available to them in terms of jobs? When we look at all of the social risk factors that we talked about in the beginning, what do they have in terms of access to transportation, to food? We have to look at all of that. Next, we have to look at the discussion of who are our, who are our partners? Who is already doing work because the will doesn't need to be recreated? And who can we partner with? Who's willing to really go into those communities that they haven't gone into maybe before? I chose some partners that have done some work in it. So I had the buy-in already with the NAACP locally, the Urban League locally, and two of our city high schools. Those were gonna be my partners. Um, and then we looked at what will the strategy be? We know that there are already workforce programs that are exist, but how do we move those workforce programs now into communities that they really hadn't thought about? You hear it over and over when you hear about climate change, those that suffer the most have the least benefit from all of the grants and funds that come from climate change. And so as we look at that strategy, it was going to be a strategy of education. Number one, what is climate change? What are the health effects? How do disparities in income play into that? And now what's the solution? Because you always want to end with the solution. And then the implementation plan of really getting that training done and those students and adults and some returning citizens certified in those areas. And hopefully looking at how we expand it nationally and publish on it so that it can become a model. So since the fellowship, I did a lot um, during fellowship of lecturing to students and residents, uh, writing op-eds, um, lots of meetings with community partners, that will all continue. Um, I think as we have this conversation more and more, this room will grow because you continue to recruit like-minded clinicians. And I'll continue that work with the Illinois Clinicians for Climate Action. Um, I think I talked a lot about it over those 10 months. And so um, the CEO of my hospital said, well, I'm going to put you on this committee so you can sustain the whole medical district. Um, so Sure. I, I, I think as we grow and learn more, we have some uh, facilities in our area. There are four hospitals in our area that are doing really, really well, some not so much. And so that's where the next job came. How do I look at the carbon footprint of my own institution and begin to figure out how we become more um, sustainable but environmentally friendly uh, for the environment around us and the patients that we take care of? Um, so again, thank you for the opportunity. Um, it's been a grand opportunity, um, and I hope it continues. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Collins. And um, so again, I think it's re really impressive what the, the work that uh, many of our fellows are doing. Um, next, we will hear from Dr. Frank Samante, uh, who uh, is a neurologist uh, from Boston uh, and works with a number of the um, institutions that are um, associated with Harvard and um, uh, wor works with, uh, has been focused on disability, um, Dr. Samante. Hi, I'm, I'm uh, Frank Samante. I'm a pediatric and adult neurologist. Um, I've been involved with Harvard for about 15 years. And uh, subsequent to that, I've also done a lot of work in uh, global public health. So when I um, 
uh, first got started, we didn't know that about five, 10 years ago, we started seeing a lot of children having uh, frequent seizures, particularly when there's a uh, extreme weather events. So be it cold during winter time or during the summertime, we noted that they started having a lot of seizures. And fast forward where we're in right now, we are able to understand that uh, many of these children with epilepsy and other neurodevelopmental issues are actually vulnerable to extreme weather events. Um, climate change, uh, put, that all, put that all into perspective. So the adverse impact of climate change on individuals in multiple vulnerable, vulnerability factors require adequate measures. And right now, what I've been doing is that uh, I've, I've been allowing myself to focus not only on children and their families uh, in terms of uh, their neurological conditions, but I'm also trying to expand the level of discourse when it comes to climate health. Um, the current health policy planning and resiliency measures are oftentimes lacking. Uh, during the course of my fellowship uh, at the consortium, I uh, started checking with, with the other programs and other institutions nationwide. And what I came across was uh, there was this individual at the Public Health Institute in California. And one of the things that he mentioned to me was to focus on people with disabilities. So I decided to focus my capstone project uh, during the fellowship in looking at ways in how we can uh, help not only children, but entire individuals with uh, disabilities. So we're talking about PWDs in the setting of climate health. So what does that exactly mean? Well, you know, when it comes to emergency management, uh, for instance, let's say in Hurricane Katrina at that time, people were evacuated from their homes. They were brought to evacuation centers. The problem with that is once they are put into the situation, um, and by the way, when we speak of disability, it's not just physical impairment, right? So we talk about cognitive and behavioral uh, impairment, hearing, and all this kind of stuff. So there are different forms of disability to, uh, to start with. And I think what we are able to see right now is that in the evacuation process, there's oftentimes a lack of resources, not only from the standpoint of the uh, medical healthcare, but also in the delivery of these evacuation centers. Uh, they would oftentimes require their devices, um, extra medications, and when they are put in this situation, they cannot cope. And, uh, and that's really the big problem right now. So in terms of my uh, key actions in my capstone, I started uh, doing a lot of seminars and I, uh, I joined a lot of discussions, uh, Delaware Medical Society, the Georgia and also South Carolina last year. Um, I participated as a speaker. I wanted to um, advance the level of uh, understanding with the physicians and how they can actually engage uh, this type of problems with their uh, patient population. And subsequent to that, I've, uh, I, I was also joined by uh, Dr. Renee Robinson with the AUCD. Uh, we, and she's absolutely right. We were well received because at that point in time, nobody was talking about this. Now, in terms of my capstone, I continue to expand the level of collaboration. But I think that moving forward, uh, we need to be able to uh, have data. And that when we speak of health policy development and changes, we should actually be talking about data. Um, it, it's hard to discuss this sort of changes, especially at the local municipal level, when there's really no data that we can present to them. And I think um, coming from a strong academic background, I've always felt that the data science is phenomenal. Um, I, I have done uh, publications looking at predictive modeling analysis, which means you know, we are able to predict um, for the next few years. And I think this is going to be a valuable instrument when we engage uh, people in the health develop in the health policy initiatives at the local government, um, because although there is the American Disabilities Act, many of the policies at the local municipal level are usually not enacted. And as we know, uh, vulnerable populations, uh, uh, people of color, uh, they are oftentimes you know at the forefront of this. You know, there's there's a lack of resources. So what I'm hoping to do in in continuation of my capstone will be to start looking at the hard data at the local level and present that uh, to our politicians, to the advocates, so that we can create a better, not only a better sense of awareness, but use those data so that we can really make some hard changes in the health policy. And uh, I hope to work closely, and I hope to continue my work closely with the uh, consortium and, uh, and with the rest of the fellows. So thank you very much.
Uh, so thank you. So um, why don't we go ahead and move to questions if people have um, questions. Dr. Cook, I was just curious uh, when you were asked to um, take on this work for the Sustainability Committee, because it's something we're dealing with right now in our healthcare system. Were you able to get protected time <laughs> to do so? And, and how do you how do you navigate that? Because I think there are so many priorities right now that we all want to be involved, but uh, it becomes hard with limited time. I'm going to use my outside voice. <laughs> no. Oh, is your mic not working? Oh, no, mine isn't either. Oh, yours is now. Oh, it is now. Oh, this one is. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, so no protected time. And now, um, so right now I wear, I'm, I'm the CMO, but I, I also do some GY oncology. So I already wear two hats um, in addition to some other things I do, but no protected time. Um, my strategy is really to look at where this is going to go in terms of how I build a program and definitely ask for that. I think it's not reasonable to think that anybody can do um, any part of that work uh, without some protected time. I also am the co-chair for the Health Equity Committee. Um, and so uh, my hope is that once I can streamline what our uh, footprint looks like in our institution, really um, look at somebody who can actually carry that forth, if not me. Because, yeah, I definitely need time. And I want to echo that. No protected time. But the thing that I asked for my leaders in the um, Climate and Health Equity Fellowship, I said, make me fluent in climate. And a lot of that had to do with making sure that I did my homework. So it was not protected time, but I definitely did it. And I feel like they were successful in making me fluent in climate. <laughs> Go ahead, next question. Hi, thank you all for your work. Uh, this question is for Dr. Collins, but really- I'm sorry, can you introduce yourself? I'm Caitlin Rubley. I'm an ER doc uh, at the University of Colorado. So my question has to do with people within the criminal justice system and whether any of your work um, was with those specific populations, uh, specifically looking at recidivism. So I don't think we have any data on recidivism yet, but we do have a portion of it that looks at returning citizens. There's a program just for them. Um, as you know, um, that's a population that has a really hard time finding work once they're released. So absolutely, it was really important that we included them in, in that. Yes. Yeah, a, a number of our um, NMA docs that have been working in this area, you know, they uh, work in institutions and, and many of them don't have air conditioning. And so they see so many uh, health effects from heat. Um, uh, you know, if they're confined, they can't get out. Um, there's a moisture. So so there are others um, within the NMA that, that do a lot of work and are very concerned about that uh, as you apparently are. Yeah, thank you. And if I can add one more thing, I think the part that made it a little easier to be able to tie that in Part of my system, we run the jail. Um, our health system runs the jail and we run the juvenile detention center. Very commonly, those same detainees then become our members in the health plan. So it only made sense that as we look at how we improve their lives, that we improve how they are able to get employment. Next question. Thank you all. I'm Amanda Milton. I'm a pediatrician in Northern California. And my question sort of builds a little bit on Dr. Patel, but specifically I'm curious for the, the surgeons who mentioned like we don't talk about climate change as surgeons. I'm curious if you could share a bit more about how you approached that with your colleagues and what you found to be successful and where you feel like you've gotten. I think uh, identifying others who will champion the causes are very important. And it means repeated going to leadership and saying, this is, this is important, this is affecting us. Here's the data, this is what I see. And over time, we have gotten some momentum. So I'm proud to say that some of the surgical organizations have really started to take a look at this and form relationships globally to look at uh, climate change and surgery and how the field of surgery is impacting 
our carbon footprint and what we can do, what guidelines we can come forth and um, healthcare without harm and practice green health and all of the other guidelines that are out there are so helpful for, I feel, the feel that it's just beginning to start to dip their toe in to see what's, what's happening. It means I've given some lectures where it is quiet <laughs> because this is the first time anybody is bringing this to them. You know, I'm not talking about, you know, cholecystectomy or so, you know, like climate change. Nobody's mentioning this, but then when you start to delve into the differences and what we see and the impact that we're having, you know, they understand and it's going to take more of these lectures and it's going to take more of the leadership of organizations and institutions saying that we want to, we want to make this a priority for us to start to move the needle, but it, it is happening, but it has been slow. And I think we're behind a lot of other specialties, certainly like the pediatricians, the pulmonologists who have been out front already. I think in surgery, we are just starting to move that needle. And it's unfortunate because, you know, we are responsible for like 30% of the waste of a hospital system and, you know, our anesthetic gases. There's so much that can be done in that field. And we have a lot of work to do, but it is starting to move, um, but we've just been behind. So any other surgeons out there, please join us. <laughs> um, we're happy to have you and, and start to put that voice out there for the patients. What I'll add is this education too, exactly as Shanita said, very commonly, everybody only hears about aesthetic gases. They don't hear about the cost of gowns that are not used as opposed to recycled. They don't hear about the cost and the amount of CO2 emissions, say in a hysterectomy, that is vaginal versus abdominal versus laparoscopic versus robotic, robotic being the highest and CO2 admission, although we're not going to believe robotic surgery because we know the benefits. So really beginning to look at our supply chain where it becomes really important in surgery also, you know, getting the buy-in from companies to look at where their carbon footprint is in terms of production of equipment. Is that equipment recyclable? Is that equipment able to be used multiple times? Um, and then looking at the entire uh, sort of journey of the patient through the hospital from transportation to what they eat. So when we look at surgery, there are many aspects that we can look at. Um, and so that's what I found has been really helpful in sort of tying it all, you know, just laying it out on the table. And because people very commonly don't think of it. They just think about you're in the operating room and the gas, that's it. And so the educational piece becomes really important, sorry. And one last thing on that, globally, they're ahead of us yeah, than where we are in the US. So in Europe, Industry is already very involved, looking at how they can make an impact in decarboni decarbonization. And so that's starting to trickle here in the United States as well. Uh, I also try to uh, engage the surgeons, but can't do anything uh, without actual surgeons leading the, the, the charge. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm really thrilled to have them. Yes. Uh, we have a question from Linda Rudolph. I think it might be Dr. Linda Rudolph um, for Dr. Collins. Um, I'm wondering if you have been able to advance any climate protective changes in the Illinois Medicaid program, for example, paying for the HEPA filters for children with asthma or paying for room AC to protect against heat illness. I haven't been able to move it yet, but constantly talk about it. Um, I think as we are looking at our cost for, for, for members in that scenario, we know that it makes a difference. We know that removing mold from homes, removing asbestos from homes keeps our members out of the ER. We know that allowing air conditioning in the homes keeps them out of the ERs during the winter. So we know all of that, really just trying to get Medicaid to understand the return on investment for doing that. So not moved yet, but but we'll continue to talk about it because we know the benefits. Okay, uh, you look familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Is there time for another question? Yes, yes, please, Mona. <laughs> uh, so uh, I can can you go for those of you? Yeah, not of everybody knows you, Mona. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'm Mona Sarfati. Um, a um, emeritus director of the consortium. <laughs> um, I'm really interested to hear more about the kind of reception 
that you all have received from the different audiences that you've tried to talk to. And so, you know, you've all kind of touched on this in various ways, but I would really love to just hear more about the various audiences that you've tried to start these conversations with and what kind of response you're getting. I can start it and I think everybody can will, will chime in because everybody has their separate experiences. I would say overall, it's been a very positive reception uh, from the students finding out how interested they, they are, but how much they didn't know from my attendings the same. You know, I had a gentleman tell me after I gave a lecture, he was like, that's why everybody is coming into the ER with allergies right now. I've never seen so many allergies come into my clinic. Um, and so um, another lecture, and it, it, we talked about environmental justice and where plants are related to where cancers are and lung cancer and respiratory diseases. And people were astounded when you put up the map of where that exists based on the ethnicity of the folks that live in those communities. So I think it's been enlightening for a lot of, a lot of populations and, and areas that I've talked with. Um, and then there are some, you give a lecture and the room is just silent. Like they, they just don't know what to say. But I, I would say overall, it's been really positive. Um, I, I think there's a lot of momentum once people know that there are other interested parties who want to move it along. Um, you, you, you build momentum, I think. I spoke at the clinic where I work. Um, it's an FQHC. And I let them know that they need to kind of pay attention to what I'm saying because there is going to be a focus on utilizing federally qualified healthcare centers in the future as kind of like hubs for this climate change. And I mean, they were on bated breath, you know, just embracing every word because nobody else had talked to them about anything related to climate change. I spoke at a, one of the oldest black churches in Milwaukee on Martin Luther King's birthday. And they wanted to know about health disparities. And of course I related it to environmental injustice, climate change and so forth. As a result of that, I was asked to be on two different um, community organizations that are focused on the effects of climate change in their community. One of them was called Walnut Way and another one was called Watermark. Um, so I, I have to say so far, I've had an excellent reception. Um, I think that in my case, there's a, there's two sides to it. So the first side, of course, is that when I engage uh, the level of discussion when it comes to climate health uh, in, in communities and also in my patients um, and in other physicians, especially during my talks with the Georgia and also Delaware Medical Society, I think it, it was generally uh, positive in the sense that, uh, you know, we are talking about something else different from the perspective of people with disabilities. Um, but the other coin of that is I, I'm also an academic neuroscience neurologist, which means that, um, you know, when, when I talk about this to other uh, neuroscience specialists or neurologists, the, the bottom line is what's really the hard science behind that, especially in Boston. Um, so I, so I, I think that um, what I'm trying to do is, um, which I do have a pretty good idea, um, my background in molecular neurosciences allows me to be able to discuss this from the standpoint of uh, human brain. So I think this is very important in terms of advancing the level of education, not only with the regular primary care physicians, but also with the subspecialties. Because I think that we, if we don't discuss the molecular basis of all of this understanding with climate health and how people are going to be affected by this, our patients and the cohorts, then I think we're also missing that uh, key knowledge gap. So I think that has to be addressed. And I think this is part of the reason why my, uh, the way I'm formulating my strategy will be looking at the molecular science to try and explain our understanding. And, and there's enough data out there. It's just a matter of presenting it from that perspective and at the same time backing it with hard science data. So I think as physicians, we're sort of in this process already where we can understand it. But the next step is how do we explain for these things that we that the changes or the things that we are expecting to happen to our patients? I think it's varied, the responses that I get. I think when I speak with my patients and I explain why their asthma is worse this year, they understand it and it just makes sense to them. When I speak to my colleagues, um, a lot of times it's a quiet room because they're getting it for the first time, but it's not a negative room. 
It's just, this is new information being presented to me. And I'll, most of the time, I get positive reaction after that. I get folks wanting to get involved, move the needle, learn more, get educated. Uh, as a bariatric surgeon, I do a calculator for my patients um, that looks at their predicted weight loss and resolution of comorbidities in a year and risk profile. And I was thinking about it as my colleagues were speaking and it stratifies by, by race, but there's nothing in there that's looking at, does this person have green spaces? Um, what's the heat and, and those? there's no climate and health um, equity part to it. And so how accurate is that for my patients? Maybe I should stop. Um, or <laughs> we need to find a way to add that in. So there's so much to do. Uh, and I think as um, physicians, we are here because we wanna solve the problem. We want to make our patients better. So even in those quiet rooms, it's quiet, but they're listening and they want to get more involved. So again, it goes back to the education and making sure that we can get that message across so they can take it even further than we can. Can I add one more thing? Sure, go ahead. Well, the other two things I, I just wanna say that I made a comment. You said one that, thing. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're related, no. <laughs> for, I, I looked at it as like healthcare and non-healthcare. Um, I, I think for healthcare, building it into what they already do. So when I talk about taking a history, an environmental history and an environmental scan, you're already doing that. We do a full h &P. Just ask a few more questions to really look at environment. And then when you're talking to legislators, don't, don't go along party lines. Just talk about health, that's your area. Leave the separation of where the party lines are with the legislators and just talk about health and the benefits and the ill effects of health um, has been really helpful. Great, thanks so much. Well, thanks, Pat. And I do want to uh, thank uh, those of our sponsors, um, Johnson & Johnson, the Rob Wood Johnson Foundation, the American Medical Association, the American College of Physicians, uh, the uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic and, and Atmospheric Administration, and Virginia Sea Grant. Um, so without them, this would not have been possible. So thanks. Uh, and I, another round of applause for our 